it! Just do it! Don't let your dreams be dreams. Yesterday, you said tomorrow. So just do it! Make your dreams come true! Just do it! Welcome to Successful Dropout. This podcast is for the outliers, the innovators, the rebels, those that dare to dream and act on their dreams. I'm your host, Kylan Ginger. Join me as we find out what it takes to drop out, grind, and succeed. This episode is brought to you by Praxis. Guys, if you've been listening for a while and you're inspired to drop out, grind, and succeed and to start turning your dreams into reality, Praxis helps you go from student to startup in just nine months, okay? To land your dream job or to start your own company, you don't need to sit in more classrooms or blast out resumes or go through years of training. You can start today. Praxis combines a three-month professional boot camp with a six-month paid apprenticeship at a startup that leads directly to a full-time job. And startups aren't just for coders, by the way. They're sales positions, marketing, operations. Even if you're not sure what you're interested in, Praxis places you with a growing, dynamic company where you get paid to do work you love to do, where you get to become part of a team, and where you learn how to create value. It's not just an internship, it's real work. In addition to the apprenticeship, you complete an intensive education program that combines professional development training, skill building projects, and one-on-one coaching. You'll leave the program with a full-time job offer and the skills and experiences you'll need to work for any company that you want to work for or to even start your own company. No degree is required to get started on your career, guys. Whether you're an ambitious go-getter right out of high school, a creative thinker who's bored in college, or a college grad looking forward to something better than more school or a cubicle job, Praxis is a phenomenal resource for you. $50,000, okay? $50,000 is the average salary that Praxis graduates are getting with these full-time jobs that they get right after the program in in less than a year. If you want to learn more, go to discoverpraxis.com, discoverpraxis.com, and let them know that you found out about them through Successful Dropout and start turning your dreams into reality, guys. And with that being said, let's get to the show. What is up, Successful Dropouts? Get stoked because today on the show we have William McCandless. William is a high school dropout with no college education that accidentally became a high-converting direct response copywriter and online marketer after being fired from almost every normal job he's ever had. Currently living in Thailand, traveling the world, and trying not to drink too much with doe-eyed Swedish backpacker girls, William is currently making the transition from reference-only copywriter, only known in small, high-paying circles, to product creator and teacher. In the next month, he'll be releasing a brand new high-end course called The Dark Art of Copywriting, Embracing the Power of Persuasion, in which he'll teach the driving psychology behind what makes copywriting work and how to use this power for your business, personal life, and social interactions. Hey, good intro you you got for me there, man. Um, But tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do. I wrote that? Jeez, I forgot I wrote that. Um, So what I I essentially do is I've I've put a lot of labels on myself over the last um, seven years that I've I've been working online. Um, I would say I'm a writer. I would say I'm a copywriter. I would say I'm a marketer because I never really knew how to explain it. But at this point, I've settled on uh, direct response copywriter, which is essentially the the industry term that that I that I am. Um, so direct response copywriting essentially entails um, what what I do is I'm the one that writes the words that converts things. Uh, direct response copywriting is one of the oldest and most effective forms of marketing over the last 100 years. It's consistently quantifiable down to the dollar. Whereas general copywriters would write a, uh, a cute jingle or a cute slogan like Taco Bell's Yokiro Taco Bell or something like that. Right. And then debut a 30 second commercial and billboard campaign and radio campaign where they can only guess if sales jump up over the next two quarter for their client that it was due to their advertising campaign. Direct response copywriters are the people who have those, for example, this would this would be the easy, most easily relatable one, are the people that have those 30 minute 
infomercials that appear at fringe television time at two o'clock in the morning that are quantifiable down to the dollar, meaning this many commercials debuted on this many networks at this time and this many conversions, recordable conversions happened during that time. So we're not oh. the we're not the come up with fancy slogans and throw things out there on billboards and then make up numbers to justify our marketing campaigns. We're the people that can literally tell you that this many uh, uh, marketing channels went out and this is how many people came back and paid money for it. So that's essentially what direct response copywriting is. The difference between general copywriting and direct response is, is that in a nutshell. Okay, and so and you mentioned, or we mentioned in the bio that it's small, kind of high paying uh, circles. So, you know, what is that exactly? I mean, do, are you, do people kind of outsource to you, basically? Um, some, some people have in-house teams that outsource, but I, w- I would say the majority of the people that hire me don't have in-house teams for this. I'm, I'm like a specialist, like a sniper, I guess. Um, hmm. um, they, they'll ha- a lot of people, like large international, let's say, publishing companies, will have in-house teams to handle the copywriting for their ongoing email campaigns or their ongoing blog and web content, um, maybe ads that they're putting out, like PPC ads and stuff like that. But what they look for is uh, in direct response copywriting. For example, let's say that you're a publishing company and you have several financial advisories, like let's say penny, penny stock investing and um, uh, uh, investing in the stock market, let's say. So this publishing company um, will have their in-house team. But then they'll come to people like me when they want to run a promotion. So they'll, they'll contract out to people that they know have a good track record. They, they probably got referenced by another guy who referenced me from another person who referenced me from another person. Okay. And so they'll, they'll come to me. That's why it's like a tight-knit circle. They'll come to me and ask me to write one of those long-form sales pages or video sales letters, those 45-minute video sales letters that they send out to their mm. email. And what they want to do is have me beat what's called a control. The control is the currently best-performing uh, letter or, or, or video. The, um, that's probably someone else did. So they're constantly pitting us in competition with each other. And if I can beat out the control, which is, means um, sell more than their current control, then, then that's where all the pats on the backs and more references come. Um, so I would say mm-hmm. they always have their in-house teams, but for when it comes down to like specific promotions where they need those long-form direct response copy, they tend to contract out I'd say 90% of the time. And then if you do a really good job, they'll stick with you. But they're always, I'd say they're always fishing around for someone else <laughs> right. to, to, because that competition's healthy. It really is. Right. Absolutely. No, that's really interesting. I guess I never really thought about it, you know, because I get a lot of those emails. Um, I've seen a lot of those sales pages and some that are incredibly well done um, where the copy just seems to, I guess, sell itself. And so that's really interesting to kind of hear what what kind of goes on behind the scenes with a specialist like uh, like yourself. How did you uh, get into that space? Uh, 100% on accident. Uh, you know, as as <laughs> we're on the successful dropout podcast, so I dropped out uh, of, of high school when I was like 16, I think. Uh, even if I had stayed in high school and done like a really, really good job, I wouldn't have been out until I was 19. I, I never studied. I never did any homework. I fell asleep in all my classes, and usually I was skipping school. Um, so <laughs> I, I just dropped out, and, and I went and got my good enough diploma, which is my GED. Yep. And I, I, had read, I had read way too much beat literature, like you know Jack Kerouac's On the Road and, and, and consuming Hunter S. Thompson and Bukowski and – and Tom Wolfe and and just all these like beat era uh, writers, and I, I wanted to be that on the road writer, you know, hitchhiking and weird stuff like that. Um, so it, it originally, I started out doing that, and uh, of course, I I got some like small regional magazine column writing jobs. For example, my first job was when I was. 19 and I would just sit on Craigslist all day going to the writing section and I would reply to every single post even if I I, I had no experience or anything right 
So one time uh, somebody posted up, and it was called at the time Secrets of the South magazine. It was out of Savannah, Georgia, and they they covered like you know typical lifestyle stuff around the South Carolina lowlands and, and southern Georgia area. Right. Uh, frequently called the Coastal Empire. Um, so I, I went down. Uh, I, I I sent them a piece called Savannah. Get drunk, but don't fall in the hole. I loved Savannah. It was my one of my favorite <laughs> cities. And so I sent them this article, and I never. I, I decided like they they said you have to have been published before and blah blah blah. So I sent them this article, and I didn't tell them it wasn't published, but I didn't, <laughs> you know. So they they got it, and they really liked it, and assumed it was a published article. Right. So they 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 got that, and they hired me. But the thing was, they hired me to cover bars, like uh, for a column called the Bar Exam, and I was only nineteen. So I told them I was twenty one, and I showed them a fake ID, and. Um, <laughs> And I, I wrote for six issues of that until they find out and considered me – their lawyer considered me a liability. Um, <laughs> oh, my god! But, but what I had was I had six issues with my name in print, and that was all I needed to start. But after that, I kind of made the, the judgment call that, that publishing was dying. I had always wanted to be like a newspaper writer, I guess. I, maybe I thought maybe I'd be like a cool journalist like Hunter Thompson. Right. You know? um, but that, that, that just wasn't going to happen. And so – I started looking for alternative ways to make money and I started out doing, you know, like getting paid five bucks to write these content farm blogs and, or, or web content here and there. And I, I just learned by doing. And then, you know, back in, I'd say, like 2010, uh, I started doing uh, ghost writing. I started uh, uh, writing people's books for them. And uh, I would write books on how to, how to do online marketing. I'd write books on how to... Uh, influence people, books, all sorts of books, but mainly centering in the self-help area, marketing, uh, motivation, and stuff like that. And in order to write these books, I had to do a ton of of research in order to yeah. write like I was an authority on it. <laughs> um, and I learned about online marketing and and learned about informational products and 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 blogging empires and all of that stuff by having to write about it. Um, and then I, I pretty much fell into uh, copywriting. I had uh, at one point someone asked, "Well, you wrote, you ghost wrote the book, so can you write the sales page for the book?" And I was like, "Well, what's a sales page?" Uh, <laughs> and then I realized it. Uh, so I had to research that. And it wasn't until a couple of years later I started asking if my sales pages were good. You know, people people kept coming back and ask, uh, asking me to do them again. And that's when I started getting into conversion st- statistics and, and, and all that whole realm of the numbers area of it and uh, just learned as I went along. So everything was pretty much by accident. Um, and then I, then I just started looking at the industry and taking it more seriously. And so how long have you been doing that now? I've been freelancing full time, meaning I haven't had any other job except freelancing for seven years. And I just turned 30. Wow. That's incredible. And you know, William, you say that it, it's on accident, but at least b- based off of what I, I know and, and uh, what I hear that you said, you know, I, I would argue I don't, I don't think it seems that accidental. Um, and there's a couple of things that you know, I want to pull out for our listeners, which is one, you know, it, it sounds like you were very clear even at an early age, you know, it was very clear to you what you didn't like and what you didn't want. And what you what you did like, uh, what, what you did want, you know, the kind of people you looked up to, the kind of lifestyle that you wanted to live, and and it, it seems like you were really clear on that, which is something that I, I feel like. The, um, go I, ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt you. The thing that I was most clear on was was this that I didn't want to work for anybody else. I've always had authority issues. Mm-hmm. I've been fired from every normal job I've ever had, like you said in the intro, and the idea that I would have to get up at a certain time and then put on clothes and then, and then go here and, and work with people I probably don't like. I, I didn't want to do that. And I also didn't even know how to do that. I didn't, I didn't even know what area of expertise I had in which that would even work. So I knew I didn't want to do that. I knew also the second most important thing was that I wanted to get paid for doing something that involved just something I already enjoy, which is sitting down and thinking about coming up with words. Hmm. So I, I, I had to, so maybe the area, I, I, you know, I'm not like a 
the great next great American novelist or fiction writer or or rogue journalist, which which was the thought I had fleshed out in my head. But I knew those two things. I didn't want to work for anybody. I wanted to be able to work from home and from anywhere. And I didn't want um, I, and I and I didn't want to have to do something that involved a lot of uh, uh, metric linear thinking. I want to do something that that allowed me to pace the floor like a madman, and <laughs> and that was my job. Or or like go. Or like go out for a, a, a bike ride or walk my dog or something, and that's part of the process of my job. I wanted to be able to do something like that. Yeah, and I just I love how how clear you were on that because I feel like um, that that kind of self awareness is something that some some people can struggle with. I know for me personally, at that age, around uh, you know high school, early years, my first just couple classes I took in in college. I had no idea, you know, what I wanted to do. There was maybe like five or six things. I was like, I could be good at this or this or this. Um, and, and so um, that's something I always encourage our listeners to do is is really get clear on what you want to be, what you want to do, and what you want to have. And then the next step there, which is another thing you said that I want to point out that I'm noticing about your story, is you took action. Um, which once people figure out what they want to do, sometimes the, the action doesn't follow either because, well, in the in our case at Successful Dropout, usually it's because people are afraid to step away from that tried and true path, you know, um, get your degree, get a good job, you know, get a good retirement, so on and so forth. And so yeah. that, you know, t- taking the action, that sounds like some, something that you did and, and sounds like you're you're living the dream now, man. And, and speaking of that, if you could just, I'd love you to give us a little bit of insight into, you know, I know you're from the U.S. and and from some place in the South, but, you know, tell us a little bit about where you're at now and what kind of lifestyle you live, because I think it's um, it's interesting. You would you consider yourself a digital nomad? Yeah, I mean, I I have to say that now because um, it's like the term that right. makes the the most sense to the most people, but um, to to well, okay, so. Right now, uh, I'm living in Thailand, um, and I could realistically live anywhere, um, but what brought me to Thailand was I was kind of researching like where I wanted to go, and at first I thought about South America, and I thought about China. Now I can't even imagine living in China. Like, I, I, don't, want, I don't want to get into it, but like Chinese tourists, like let's just say that like mainland Chinese people like went from like having nothing to having a lot of money now and they not now they don't know how to act in public but I hope they get there soon um but uh <laughs> so so I thought a lot about it and and when I looked up like people like me it seemed like there was a huge concentration of them in Southeast Asia especially uh in um a particular city in Thailand called Chiang Mai and then also some other ones like uh uh Saigon Vietnam um Bali Indonesia they seem like to be the 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 primary concentration of people. And then I looked it up and Thailand seemed like it was, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's not third world like people think. It's, it's just as developed as the West. It's just at a fraction of the cost. And there's less like rules about things here. Like I could just get away with so much more here than I would in the US. I feel a lot more, able, I feel like I have more social mobility. I feel like I have more mobility and everything. So that's why I chose Thailand out of like all the various options. Um, it's also a good jumping off point. It's, it's less than a $200 plane flight for me to go to, to Indonesia, the Philippines, Malaysia, Cambodia, Vietnam, um, oh, pretty wow. much, yeah, all these like China, Japan, like less than two, between $200 and $500 round trip tickets because of uh, services like AirAsia. So it's a good jumping off point. It's easy to jet off somewhere to a totally different country with a totally different language in like a day and stay there for like three or four days and come back. It's pretty great. Huh. So what's a, what's a typical day look like for you over there? Uh, as far as like, like my, what I work wise or just chilling well, out? J- just, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm curious about both because, um, well, typically at least so far, a lot of the guests we get on the show are, um, well, they're based here in the U S or they're tech founders and, you know, it's pretty self-explanatory, you know, what their day entails, but, um, you just have a more of a, I guess a, a, a unique um, lifestyle, and it'd be interesting to hear you share a bit about that. I'm I'm a huge procrastinator, and I don't really like to work that much. Um, so I I really only work about uh, two or three hours a day. I would say that I would say that my 
I, I, I also like structure though, even though that's kind of contradictory. So on, on a normal structured day, it would be waking up around this time, around seven or eight, and then uh, debating with myself where to go eat breakfast for, <laughs> you know, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll go out and, and go eat some food and, and chill out and drink coffee and read a book or something until like mid-afternoon. And the, the thing about Chiang Mai specifically is it's a huge coffee culture. There's a coffee shop oh, on really? every corner and they have locally grown coffee up in the mountains here called, uh, well, one of the, my favorites is Akaama. And this is all locally grown coffee, and this oh, it's wow. a huge coffee cu- culture. Um, and they have – it's almost – it reminds me of Austin, Texas, like an Asian Austin, Texas here. Um, <laughs> so I'll go around and, and do that until afternoon time. Then I'll probably uh, – I train Muay Thai here, and I go to the gym. So I'll probably go to the gym in the afternoon or early evening. I don't really get to work. Maybe I'll work an hour in the afternoon. Maybe I'll work two hours in the evening. But the bulk of my structure, if you can call it that time, is spent uh, riding my motorcycle around the mountains if I feel like it, um, getting coffee, and then, and then drinking with other expats and also locals in the evening times. Um, an unstructured day would have me falling into a uh, kind of a hedonistic hole. Uh, I'm, I might decide to jet off to Phuket, which is like this big party B-side town, and and uh, uh, stay in a nice hotel and and just start bar hopping and then kite surfing and then uh, you know what whatever's happening around there just beach culture parties and stuff like that that might last about three or four days before I realize I need to be uh, responsible. Again. <laughs> but but the the thing about living here is it's so easy to do things. I can I can walk out right now out of my door, go down the street and rent like a 650 cc. Suzuki V-Strom adventure bike and then take off with nothing but a backpack on and take off on a three-hour mountain ride through the twisty mountains all the way up to like a town called Pai. I could go up to Pai, hang out with a bunch of hippies for a couple days up in that town with beautiful views, uh, literally drink a, a, you said this is like a family show, I apologize, but yeah. literally drink like a, 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 a milkshake that has shrooms in it and sit around and, and, and trip with a bunch of people, then jump back on my bike and come back, all for about the cost of $150, including the rental of the bike, including the, the hotel that I went up there. I could do things like, like if I feel like uh, I can't concentrate very good on this particular sales piece I'm writing, I could walk down to the corner and, and pay literally 12 US dollars to have a two hour massage, like a one hour foot massage and a one hour oil massage or, or time massage or whatever. <laughs> And then, and then just decide to go eat a giant steak for half the price it would be in the U.S. And it's not the prices that matter to me. It's just some, I'm still astounded after a year and a half of being here. I'm still astounded that I can do things like that. You know, in the U.S., if I wanted a massage, it would be like some, like just a back massage. I'd have to plan around it. I'd have to schedule a time to go there. I'd have to pay like $90 yeah. just for an hour. <laughs> And, and I'd have to sit in like a lobby waiting room. Here I could just like, if they're busy at that one massage place, I just go across the street. It's just, it's, there's, there's things, there's a lifestyle that you can have here that you can't have in the States. So, I mean, that, that's what I'm able to pal around doing here is just travel whenever I want, rent a giant 650cc Ninja and drive around town if I want, jet down to the beach if I want. And if I want to be responsible, it's basically just walking around uh, in Chiang Mai and doing whatever I want. It's great. <laughs> well, back to your more of your dropout story, William. How did your friends' family react when you when you made that decision? I don't know. I mean, um, so so when I dropped out, I I I made the decision, and of course, I had to have parental consent. Yeah, because it's high school. When I dropped right? out of yeah, high school, thing. yeah. When I was sixteen. I wasn't. I think if you're seventeen, you don't. So I. <laughs> I remember I called up my dad. I'm not particularly friendly with my dad, and, and um, uh, there, there's a lot of tumultuous history between my dad and I. And at that time, he wasn't even living at home. But I, I, I called him up, and, um, and I was just like, I, I want to drop out of high school. I hate school. And like to very, my, my, my immense surprise at the time, he was just like, yeah, just drop out. Teachers are stupid, basically. <laughs> and my, da- my, my dad was always a self-starter. And so he's just like, yeah, drop out. And I told my mom, I was like, I want to drop out. She's like, all right, if your dad says so, I guess so. <laughs> um, it, I, was, I was very, very surprised at 16 years old. Why? I don't even know why to this day they, they were just like, yeah. Because I, I think it, one of the reasons I always had trouble in school since I was in elementary school, 
you know, they put me on Ritalin. They they diagnosed me as ADHD. They, oh gosh. You know, they like I, I was in private school in Alabama because the public schools were just so bad there. Um, mm-hmm. And and uh, and and you know, they put me in like special learning classes, and they and they sent me to mandatory counselors. I was always in the principal's office. Uh, that trend continued all the way up until I was in middle school and then high school. I never seemed to get out of that being in trouble, being labeled as learning disabled. So that to me and, and to them, I guess, the natural progression was just to leave the entire system. Um, but a friend of mine recently told me just about a month ago, he shot me a message on Facebook. Uh, he said, because uh, I wrote this down as I was looking over the questions you were going to ask, he basically told me, he's like, man, it looks like you're living the dream over there in Thailand. That's really cool. A few buddies of mine, you know, were sitting around at the bar here back in Georgia, where I'm from, and they apparently, I don't remember this happening, but I was in in school suspension called ISS with this guy that I know. And apparently I told him, just pissed off that I I kept getting in trouble, I told him that that I'm just going to drop out and make it on my own. And he told me that at the time he thought I was crazy. Mm. Um, But yeah, so as far as like what my friends thought, that's the only feedback I've gotten. (laughs) And it always surprises me to hear that people are talking about me because I never talked to anybody in high school. Not really. Uh, yeah. So the, the idea that there's like a few guys <laughs> from my high school past sitting around at a bar last month talking about that. But yeah. <laughs> well, maybe they'll listen to this podcast afterwards and they'll talk a little more. <laughs> um, now, when you, when you did drop out, did you have any uh, fears that you can remember and how did you overcome those? I was completely 100% confident and foolhardy. I've, I've always been that way. I had zero fears, zero. I just figured I'm just going to figure it out. I'm going to make it. And right. the, there's fears that came later with white knuckling, you know, not having enough money to pay your rent, wondering, like, should I have gone to college? Like, <laughs> like, like is this the right thing to do? Uh, that came later. But at the time when I started, I had zero fears about anything. Um, so I can't really say I had any. Now, if you had to go back and, and I guess re-drop out, was there anything that you would have done, you know, differently now? No, I, I, I would have, I would have done the same thing. Um, maybe, uh, no, you know, I wouldn't have done anything different. I'm sitting over here thinking about how I, when I, when I dropped out all the stupid decisions that I made with like particularly like overwhelming amount of uh, drug use and and partying and and very dangerous situations that I put myself in but I wouldn't change it because it it helped me get to where I am I mean when I was 19 I I had that little job at the magazine but it wasn't a lot of money it was like $180 per article and it was every month so that was $180 a month off this this little writing job and so I took a I took a job working on the docks yeah. Um, on, on the Georgia docks from 6 p.m. until 6 a.m. My lunch was midnight. I, I was loading these giant bags of kaolin and starch uh, onto these huge boats coming in from like Japan and Saudi Arabia and stuff. And, and I, I was, it was dangerous and I was caked in white dust constantly. I was so unsatisfied. I'd, I'd come home at 6 o'clock in the morning and open up a 12-pack of beer that I bought illegally and I'd buy drugs and snort cocaine. I mean, that that was that was my life for like a year. Um, but you know, I can't go back and say that that was a bad experience because, you know, working that hard job and and um, and and having to work several more odd labor jobs like that, and even working at a porn shop at one point, um, that all brought me to this point. So I, I wouldn't mm-hmm. say I'd do it differently. Now, you know, another question you might have seen on there that I like to ask, which is, is just, you know, anybody who's um, making that decision to drop out and they're getting a lot of flack for it from friends and family, would you have any advice for them on, on how to handle that based on what you went through? You know, the, I, I would say that the flack I got wasn't so much the dropping out, but the I want to be a writer. That, I, that was the flack. Um, Ooh, yeah. Yeah. You know, like, what a stupid idea to be. It's like saying you want to be a, a, musician and only be a musician like you're gonna get paid for (laughs) for doing concerts or something or like an artist or whatever um so and and it made me doubt myself almost constantly but it was it was i knew that i could make it work uh i had an innate understanding that consistency is is the key to all success 
from losing weight mm-hmm. to to you know building muscle if you want to talk about it in a sense like that as long as you stay consistent you can't fail all the time yeah there's going to be a breakthrough point where the consistency pays off what so what i what i had to do was shut down seeing all my friends in college for example that really killed me for a long time you know all all my friends from high school were were in college and it seemed like they were living this amazing college life where where they got to party all the time and then they and then they got to go travel on like these student things where you go study art in France or or whatever you know and and I was sitting here in in these crappy crappy low paying apartments and jobs I hated sitting there telling everybody I'm going to be a writer you know and and that flack that I kept getting from everybody on all sides, it constantly made me reconsider. Maybe I should go to college. Maybe I should take that GED thing I did and go to a two-year community college and then go to a four-year college and then find something that, that, that makes sense, that's responsible. You know, um, it, It's constant doubt, but I knew that consistency pays off. It doesn't, there's people that make money in the weirdest ways I've noticed, like in, in niches that I would never even think was a niche. You know, and and they and they make that money because they 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 were consistent. Somebody is willing to pay for that thing that they do, and they were consistent, and they found a way to position themselves that made sense over time. And 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 so I, I would say the advice that I would give on that is the advice that everyone who who has made it, so to speak, will give. Don't give up on your dreams, kid. Don't give up on your passions. But it's not as it's not as simple as that. Because it's, it's, I wasn't passionate about copywriting. I just became passionate about copywriting in like the last year, really. I'd always considered it this monkey on my back, this thing that I had to do to the minimal basis to pay my bills and to, to, to do that so I could do the other things that I really wanted to do, which was you know fiction writing or whatever. So even when you're doing something that, that – is a part of what you originally were passionate about. You may not even be passionate about that, you know? Um, so, so I don't want to say follow your passions, follow your dreams. I just want to say follow what you're good at. Know what you're good at. You have to know that. I'm good at writing. That's the only thing I was ever good at, right? Uh, the other subsequent thing that I figured out was that I was good at, like, street on a, on a street smart level, I was good at convincing people of things and reading people. So that went hand in hand to develop what? Into a talent for copywriting. So, so you have to know what you're good at and stick with it. If, and you got to know what you're bad at. You know, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't sit in a classroom. I can't work for anybody else. I'm bad at it. Yeah. So the, I only had the option to make this work. So I, I would say it's not about following your passion or following your dreams. It's sticking to what you're good at. And if you're not good at sitting in a classroom and dealing with all that crap and working at a, a normal job, if you're not good, if you don't perform well, if it makes you unhappy, you're obviously not good at it. You're not, you're not going to ever succeed very well in that environment. So you've got to put yourself in the environment that you will succeed at. You've got to do that no matter what everyone else is saying. And they'll get angry at you too. They'll get so mad. They'll, they'll, people will scratch and claw and pine and cuss and spit about, about how you're not supposed to be successful at this. You're just not supposed to be because I'm unhappy in my life and I don't like where I'm at and you're not supposed to be successful. And it's not that easy. You know, they'll say that stuff. And I, I, lo- I love that line, it's not that easy. Yeah. <laughs> like if I were to tell you to go to the golf course right now and swing a club and hit the ball – and make it go into the hole in the least amount of swings possible. That's a very simple concept. That the simplicity of that concept never changes. And someone will always be like, well, it's not that easy. Well, of course it's not. But the concept is easy. The concept of swinging the club and hitting the ball into the hole is a very simple concept. <laughs> it might take you 10 years to be able to do that in an efficient manner, but the concept is simple. But people will get angry at you. They want you to fail. They want to drag you down. They want you to be like them. And they want to tell you it's not that simple. Well, it's not simple. It takes time. But the concept is simple. So uh, that was a rant. I'm sorry. No, dude. That's, <laughs> I, I love that. I love that entire thing. That's what I'm getting after. It's obvious that you're you're very passionate about this and you've been through – it sounds like you've just been through experiences where it's only solidified this kind of thinking in your in your mind. And I love the – the the talk about consistency, um, 
that actually hasn't been you know brought up as much as I, I I would like it to in some of these interviews. Um, but I think it's such a key thing is that whatever you're doing, um, oftentimes the simplest key to success is just that consistency. Consistency That's doing it day in and day out. Success. It's yeah. the only key to success. Consistency is the key to all success. Yeah, and and a and another way to say that too, I think it was Zach Latta, um, a teal fellow that we had several episodes back. He he talked about, I believe it was him. He talked about um, breaking, not breaking the chain, um, as another way to to put that. And just thinking about these the things that you do on a daily basis, um, these habits, uh, staying consistent, viewing it as like a, a chain. And when you you know when you miss it or when you when you neglect it. Um, it, it breaks that chain, and and you gotta you gotta start over. You don't have a full a full chain there. So, love that that point, man. And moving uh, more into kind of your entrepreneurial journey now, um, Boom Videos or BoomVids.com is it? Yeah. What's what's yeah, that I, about? I don't I don't really use that anymore. I don't know. It was just a <laughs> it was a <clears throat> it's my only website by the way. I don't have a website for myself. Uh, I, I actually have tried purposefully over the last uh, couple of years to, to make sure that when people Google me or, or, or my name or something, things don't come up. Huh. Um, just because I don't want to deal with I don't have a Twitter. You know, I, my Facebook is private. I don't really participate in anything. Like, like a lot of uh, guys that do what I do, that their, their whole thing is coaching and, and providing value and stuff. But I, I just wanted to have my clients contact me you know, and, and reject m- more people than I accept and, and everything. So that's my only website right now. And I'll, I'll, get, I'll explain that later if you want to, why I do that. But um, BoomVids was just an idea. I found myself a lot of the time um, uh, doing short explainer videos for people, like for opt-ins, mm-hmm. meaning like a, a, a 30 second to 60 second to 90 second short little animated script that that people need to explain a complex product in a very quick, efficient manner. Right. Um, I got a lot of those requests, and I would write the scripts. And you know, I used to work with a production company that my friend owned, and I had all these connections. And so I would always be like, "Hey, do you need anybody to do the video? I got this guy. I'll just hand you over to him." And they'd kick me back ten percent off the reference. So I thought uh, maybe I could uh, just like as a little passive income side thing, I could start up this uh, website. And then um, uh, people could contact me for explainer videos. I'll charge three thousand. I'll pay my guy one thousand. I'll pay this script writer that I know and trust two fifty, and I'll keep the difference. Um, but that lasted for like three months, and I got actually made pretty good money. But I got tired of of handling the logistics, so I just stopped. Mm. Uh, but but it's my only website, so it's the only thing that I referenced yeah. over to people. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, the only thing I could find of you. And actually, I'd love you to to, to go into the a little bit of the why behind that that you were explaining earlier. And for those of you listening, the only reason I found William was on a it was on a Reddit thread, which I'm I am not familiar with Reddit. I I don't use it at all. But I was just reading stuff people were writing about, um, you know, dropping out in that decision. And and I forget, but you you must have said wrote, something uh, guess- that. <laughs> I said that I'm a I'm a, a American digital nomad living in Chiang Mai, uh, oh, and I told yeah. like my, my dropout I'm yeah dropout living in Chiang Mai, making uh, netting at the time. Now I'm netting more. We're uh, very quickly netted more, um, but now I'm net, uh, at the time I was netting around ten thousand dollars a month. So I just put that up there, and I basically said that hey, I'm I'm getting drunk in my apartment and I'm bored. So ask me anything, and I'll <laughs> and then I also offered to consult with anybody's business. Literally any and, and I and I got over uh, three hundred PMs and I swear to God I responded to every single one of them and gave them personal consultations on their on their online businesses. Um, wow. which is really, really interesting to see what people are doing. But yeah, I did that and you were one of the people that PM'd me and asked if I could be on your podcast. I actually really like the idea. I've never seen anything like that. Very niche. Yeah, no, it's 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 been great, and so that actually kind of leads me to my next question, which which is how do you generate revenue right now? And and some some people are uncomfortable with it, but I love to ask anyways. You know, love to hear what the numbers are because I just think that's that's really inspiring to the people that that listen to the show, and that's super important too. Um, I, I I don't know why people would be uncomfortable with that. So at the time of that that Reddit AMA. The which basically, if they if people don't know, it stands it stands for Ask Me Anything AMA. Right, right, okay. So from from the time of that, 
uh, I was that was what three months ago, I believe. I was making normally around ten thousand dollars a month, which I thought was pretty good. Yeah, but I was I would charge maybe like fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars for a long form sales page uh, or something like that, um, uh, or or VSL, which is a video sales letter. But also, I had just opened up Boom Vids that month, and I had like that extra, uh, like that. That was making me about five thousand dollars just off of about three or four clients a month on that. So mm-hmm. I was working less than I ever had before and making uh, good money. Um, and uh, but but I would say it was what happened after that AMA that got me thinking that it was actually a pivotal turning point just three months ago. So I did that AMA. I realized that that uh, pe- people were messaging me and saying, why are you doing this for free? You just gave me all this really good advice. Why are you, and also, why aren't you making more? I was like, I don't <laughs> know. Um, so then, then the, the very next week after I did that AMA, I met up with a guy who I'm going to reference you to, by the way, who should definitely talk on here. Awesome. His name is Mitch, Mitch Miller, and he's a direct response copywriter too. So we have these little nomad coffee club meetups here in Chiang Mai where people get together every Friday and someone speaks and then we all go out for drinks afterwards pretty much. Um, so, so this guy got up and he's talking about you know uh, copywriting. And I'm, I, I really like the guy's personality. I was melding well with him. He's kind of like an anti-authority guy too. He, you know, he, he was in a band and partied a lot, had a heart attack at 21. Oh my gosh. You know? <laughs> like, yeah, uh, I, just, I just knew that I liked this guy. So, and, I, and I knew everything that he was saying too. So, so I went out for beers with him afterwards, and, and we just got really connected. We started talking and talking and talking. And so I asked him how much he's charged for, for sales page. He goes, $20,000 up front. Whoa. And, I was like, and I was like, what? I was like, really? He goes, he, he tells me, he said, man, have you ever asked your clients how much they make off your sales pages? And I went, not really. I just kind of write them. You know? I know they perform <laughs> good, but people can come back to me. So that, the next day, I emailed a bunch of my past clients. I dug through everything. And I asked them pretty much anybody that I had written for in the last year. I asked them, how, much, how, how are my sales pages doing? Like, how, how is my VSL doing? The first guy that got back to me told me, oh, man, it's great. Your uh, VSL drew in $150,000 in the first three weeks. Oh, my I God. Said, really? <laughs> Another guy got back to me and goes, we've been, running, we've been running your sales page as a promotion for the last seven months, and it's drawn in $1.2 uh, million. <laughs> oh, and I'm like, man. what the heck? So then I got that. Then I was like, I, I was like, what, what am I? What am I doing? What am I doing? I just was like, a, like an aha light bulb moment. So then I, I realized the election was coming up, and a lot of a lot of my uh, clients um, were like financial advisories uh, or uh, yeah, yeah, like 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 uh, investing in in uh, the election coming up in the new year. There's a lot of fears. Uh, for people that want to save their retirement or are worried about maybe the the value of the dollar being diminished mm. and things like that. Mm-hmm. So so I, I said, hey, there's there's this coming up. Let's does anybody want to do promos in time for the election? And like six people got back to me and I went, I took a deep breath and I charged each of them ten thousand dollars up front. <laughs> and they paid it without <laughs> a single without batting on it last. In the last month and a half I've made, uh, I've netted after, because I also agreed to do their videos. Mm-hmm. I sent them over to my video guy, so that costs a little bit off the top end. So I netted over $35,000 Wow! in the last month and a half in my bank. I've got more money in my bank account a single time right now than I've ever had. So this is new. Um, but but I, that was my, aha, like the biggest aha moment I had in just the last three months was that I could charge that much. And I never, th- I don't know why, but I just never thought to ask my clients how much my shit my oh sorry my stuff was making for them <laughs> that's incredible man what an incredible story and so that obviously that's uh that's here to stay right you're going to keep charging that oh i want to start charging more, more after this and i want to start charging royalties at this point um yeah, i, I feel like idea. a whole new world has been opened up to me but i i also want to explain really quick if anybody has, uh, for people that's listening um like a little bit of what i did to to get those clients because i think it's important they didn't just appear out of thin air, you mm, know. Absolutely. Um, I worked most of the last seven years getting clients off Elance.com. And I, I figured out like a proprietary, systemic way to get clients off that website. And I'll, I'll give it to you point by point right now. 
um, even though they switch to Upwork, but it still applies. It 100% applies. Right. Number one, um, uh, bid every single day. Um, even if you have jobs, even if you've got jobs, still bid every single day because um, maybe they take three, four days or maybe a week or two before they make their final decision. That way, once you're finished with one job, you've got another one in the pipeline ready to come up. Bid every single day, only bid on jobs that were posted in the last 24 hours. Never, never, uh, never on jobs that were posted 40 hours ago or anything like that. Only the last 24 hours. Try to avoid jobs that have more than 20 bids on them already unless it's really good. Um, uh, okay, so we've gone over those three points. And then uh, only uh, uh, bid on jobs that are over $100. Don't do anything less than that. Even for small projects, it's only going to take you an hour. Only... Uh, bid on jobs that are fixed price. Filter your search results so that you don't do anything per hour unless you're something like an administrative assistant. But mm -hmm. any graphic design, programming, web development, copywriting, whatever that you're doing, never, ever, ever charge per hour, ever, ever. So only bid on fixed price jobs. That was, th and then last thing is never copy and paste your proposal. And this is the most important one. I'll tell you why right now. When, when I was uh, first starting, I had the whole idea that it was a numbers game. So I would write a blanket proposal, dear, dear hiring manager, <laughs> right. whatever, right? You know, blah, 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 blah. And I would, I would copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, and bid on as many jobs per day as I could. I, I didn't get many results. Then I found out that you, you just can't do that. So I started writing every single proposal from scratch. So I would look at any personal information that they provided on Upwork, now it's Upwork. I would look at any personal information that they provided. Like for example, did they give their name? Did they give a link to their website? Did they, mm. did they name the name of their business? Did they talk about the industry? So let's say it's Joe's Coffee Shop in, in Denver, Colorado, uh, and they show their website. I was like, hey Joe, just checked out uh, uh, Joe's Coffee's, the, the website up in Denver. Man, that looks really good. I'm drinking a cup of coffee right now, but I wish I had yours. So anyway, <laughs> I looked over your website. Here's what I could do for it. You know, I found that 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 is like the one thing that separates you from from 90% of the other people bidding. Because now I'm the guy that's hiring people off of Upwork. I'm the guy that's hiring contractors. So, you know, for various small busy work I don't want to do. And I'll even put in my proposals, type in this phrase, okay? So I know you read this proposal. 90% of the people that bid, if I got 100 people that bid, 90 of them did not type in that word that I requested be typed in at the beginning of their proposal so I know that they read it. Almost every single, I put my name in there on purpose. I put my business name in there on purpose. They don't even reference any of it at all. Hmm. The 10 people that do are the only 10 people that I look at. I delete everybody else off of there. Um, so, so that's the number one thing. So People will always say that Upwork is it's too hard to get jobs and whatever, but I can guarantee you they probably aren't doing that the things that I just said. Now, as far as the clients that I have right now, the, the big spinning ones, most of them I got first off off of Elance, or now it's Upwork. I got them off of there first, and, and, um, and I, I just kept in contact with them, and I did good work for them, and they referenced me to other people, and they referenced me to other people. Now I don't have to go on there. Now I don't have to bid on jobs. Now I'm getting referenced almost constantly but that's a really really good resource still for right. people looking to do that and the other way I get clients now is I understand my industry really really well now I understand my niche I understand what people want and, and who they are so I'm able to go on to LinkedIn sales navigator for example and I'm able to uh, type in look for leads who work uh, who look for CMOs CEOs vice presidents and marketing directors who work in industries, healthcare, law, publishing companies, uh, and, and let's say web development firms who have over 500 employees, and, and, and that's my, my, my criteria, right? Because I know my industry really well and, and what right. makes money for me. So then I hire someone um, uh, off Upwork, for example, to, to just connect, 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 connect with all those leads. And let's say I would say 75% of them connect back. So then my guy takes a uh, – and, and here you can't do, you can't do like an like a individual um, uh, message to each person. It's just too many. 
Um, so I, I, right. I've written a kind of direct response LinkedIn letter that introduces myself and my services. Um, and the only thing that the Upwork guy does is he has to fill in their name. Like if it's Jim, Bob, Sally, whatever, right. fills in their name and sends it to, out to all of them. I would say that I have about a, a 10, <clears throat> 10% to 15% response rate. I'm always consistently surprised at how many people are genuinely looking to work with other people on LinkedIn. Um, so they'll get back with me and then that's how I get a few of my clients as well, um, especially the higher paying ones. And then the third way is I go to, for me, in, in my industry, this works really well, is I go to events. Like uh, here in Thailand, they have a ton of di uh, uh, digital nomad events. Well, digital nomads, they, they have online businesses and so on. So I try to go to the higher paying ones, ones where it costs like $800 for a ticket. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, there's one called Affiliate World Asia coming up in December in Bangkok, and it costs eight hundred dollars for a ticket and these are guys that are super affiliates guys that make like a hundred thousand dollar days um, have just built empires affiliate empires they constantly need sales pages um, they constantly need VSLs for various product launches so I'm gonna go there and mingle around and say I'm a copywriter so those are the three primary ways but don't knock up work don't ever knock, uh, knock up work and people do all the time if they follow what I just said there they can get clients so I would say that that's one of the things that people always ask and always want to know is how do you get your clients? And that's exactly how. <laughs> that was all so phenomenal, man. I mean, that's, it's gold really. And not just, you know, if somebody's not necessarily interested in copywriting, uh, you know, video editing, uh, for instance, or some other skill that oh, yeah. that's a complete blueprint you just laid out right there, uh, for, for gaining clients and finding success. So if you're freelancing, it's it's a really good reason. Wow. Any, any, yeah. Pretty much any kind of freelancing. <laughs> That's phenomenal, man. Thanks for sharing that. And and again, the, the next two questions I like to ask are, you know, what's your best and worst kind of entrepreneurial moment? And I feel like we already went over kind of an aha moment for you, which was realizing that you could charge more. But you know, on the flip side of that, what would you consider to be your your worst entrepreneurial moment to date? Uh, when back in two thousand. Nine. Um, I was uh, working at a porn shop and in a dog daycare. I was <laughs> and, working in a dog daycare. Yeah, and a and a dog daycare. So I was working from oh my gosh. 12, 12 midnight to to eight a.m. at a adult novelty porn shop store, and then in the daytime, after a couple hours of sleep, I would work um, at a place called Camp Bow Wow. <laughs> I actually really oh, love that, that job because I love dogs, but yeah. um, I was working there and I got fed up. I, I went back down to Savannah, my favorite city. I hadn't been there since 2005 and I I met this uh, girl there and, and I was just like, man, I really want to be back in Savannah. How, how do I do this? How do I do this? So I um, I started cold calling. At that time, I had done a lot of SEO writing and I, I knew about it and I, I, I was pretty well versed on online marketing and so I, I started cold calling I looked up on Google any web development firm that was there or online marketing firm, and I cold called them and I left messages on their machines or I talked to their secretaries. To my surprise, three of them asked me down for an interview, and one of them gave me a job. <laughs> so I got this job at this at this one place, and I thought that that my job was. They they talked about this online magazine. They they were wanting to develop this like really cool online magazine where they, you know, covered bars and restaurants and stuff like I like I had done in the past back in like 06 when I worked at that at that that magazine and I was really excited about it and I started doing a really good job. I got interviews on camera with like people like Amy Rossum and Zach Guilford. Amy Rossum like from Phantom of the Opera or The Day After Tomorrow. She's like one of those actresses. Oh wow. Uh, yeah, she was like one of the main characters in in the movie at the time was pretty big still and so I got interviews with them. I got interviews with Woody Harrelson and Josh Brody and what? people blowing people blowing through town that were that were um, uh, coming down there for the Savannah Film Festival. I got I, I did radio advertisements where I got free giveaway tickets to like a circus coming through town or big acts like Willie Nelson playing at the theater there and stuff like that. And I did all this stuff and I, I was building this whole thing up just to find out. After a couple months, they basically came to me and said. You know, this is really great, all this stuff you're doing, but it's not making us money. I said, well, yeah, I, you know, I'm building up the, the viewership and everything. I was like, yeah, but we'd rather just have you go around and talk to businesses and have them buy websites from us. And I didn't want to be, you know, 
one of those freaking guys going around knocking on doors and selling what is essentially websites. And I tried right. my best. You know, I really did. And I was only getting paid $400 a week at the time. And I tried my best. And then I, you know, they told me, well, you're not making enough money. You're fired. So I was like, you know, this is 2009. I'm fired. I just got this new apartment, which was costing me like $650 a month. And I, even though that's not a lot, really, to me, it was like, crap, how do I pay for this apartment? How do I pay <laughs> for the cable bill and everything? So my first reaction was just to get drunk. So I got, I got <laughs> drunk for a week straight. I got drunk for a week straight. I, like, I, I would wake up and I'd go buy another, another bottle and I'd drink it until I fell back asleep again. I didn't get out of bed for a week. Uh, I just was like, you know, at that time, you know, after all these crappy jobs, the, the dock, the, the, the porn shop, the, this stupid, you know, uh, selling internet job, it just made me feel mm -hmm. terrible about myself. Just absolutely 100% terrible about myself. I just felt like I was a failure. That's that, that was when you start thinking like, maybe I should have stayed in high school. Maybe I, right. maybe I should have gone to college. All my friends in college are doing great, you know. Um, and you start, you start doubting yourself. And after about a week of that, I, I like, I remember this, I don't know why this is so clear in my head, but I just woke up, you know, hung over stinking hair matted and I, and I, you know, naked and walked up to the, the window and it was like such a nice day outside. It's so calm. And I love Savannah because they've got these big oak trees dripping Spanish moss down. <laughs> Everything's very pitch, picturesque. And, I just kind of looked out at all this and I said, you know, I can do this. I can, I can do this. I have to do it. I have to pay my rent in two weeks. I have to. And you know what? I'm sick of these jobs. I just, something clicked in my head. I have to succeed. I've got no other choice to, other than to succeed. I, that afternoon, I hmm. sat down, I got on Elance. And I just, in the past, the freelancing that I had done was just in passing, you know, just a curiosity if I could make some money doing this or that. And this time I sat down and I decided I'm only going to work at home. I'm only going to do this. I didn't know where to start or what to do. And I, I started making jobs. I paid my rent the, uh, two weeks later and I paid my utility bills all off of jobs that I was getting. I started ghostwriting. I started learning about online marketing. I got really, really heavily into it. And that was that, I think that was like my biggest aha moment. To, to never do anything else other than that again ever, and I have to succeed at it. I have to. Out of pure necessity, I have no other choice other than to figure out a way to make it work. Hmm. So, and I would, I would say that there's, there's one more aha moment that happened. There's three. That was the first one. The second one was in 2011. There's, there's three that I could say. The, other, the, the third one was the one I just told you about like three months ago. That was when I realized that I could charge significantly more, but the second one, besides the one I just told you about, was in 2011, off of Elance, a client flew me out to San Jose, California um, to help him write a book. But he wanted me to attend this conference. And this guy was this huge banking consultant. He just had money out the proverbial wazoo. And he f paid for my plane flight over to San Jose, California, paid for my $5,000 ticket to go to this conference. And the conference wow. was headed up by Brendan Burchard and Frank Kern, and like all these big names, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I went in there, and I had been freelancing full-time for about a year and a half, two years. And I went in here to this conference packed full of people. I know all of them paid like between $3,000 and $5,000 to be there. And I, I sat in the crowd, and I started listening to these people talk. And you know, besides all the Tony Robbins-esque hype, you know, getting people all excited, um, Essentially, what it boiled down to was they were saying how to do start a website and market it. Essentially, that is all they were saying. And I knew everything that they were saying. And I looked at the people around me, and they were listening to this stuff like it was the most valuable information. I'm like, why did you guys pay $5,000? So you could have found this out on the internet for free. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, and then Frank Kern got up, and I, the only guy out of all those people I liked was Frank Kern. And he, he got up there, and this is a Georgia guy, you know, out of Macon. He, he lived in a trailer, you know, and now he's driving a Rolls Royce in San Diego and living in a mansion. And he got He did not give a crap about being there. He's, he's, I felt like he had the same personality as I did because I was skipping most of the keynote speakers just to go drink at the bar. 
and I just didn't care. Um, but he, he, I liked him, and at the end of it, he got up and he said, he said, you know what? He, he looked out at the crowd. He goes, you know what? You know, I love you guys because you make me rich. He, says, <laughs> he, he, said, he said, 95% of you are just going to go to another seminar of mine, and you're going to buy another DVD of mine, and you're going to buy, buy another online product of mine. You're going to keep buying them because you know what most of you are? You're just seminar. You're professional seminar goers. That's all <laughs> you'll ever be. You'll keep working in your job your entire life. You'll never develop that product you keep talking about. You'll just keep going to these seminars and making people like me rich. And they all cheered. Like they all got over there like, ha, 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 yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. And they, they, every single one wow. of the people in that room seemed to not think that was them. Right? Huh. Yeah, right. But what, 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 I, what I brought back from it was that, holy crap, people are milking this they're, they're, they're put, patting, passing themselves off as, as these, these coaches, and people are paying a crap ton of money for it. Information must be really, really valuable, you mm-hmm. know? Yep. And I didn't want to be like a coach guy or whatever, or motivational speaker or whatever, but I just realized that, that all this information that they could find for free, they were paying thousands of dollars to attend these seminars. And um, it, it was just a, an aha moment that, that – kind of like I can raise my prices, I can make money off of this forever. That's never going to end and it never has ended. So that was like my second aha. So those three. One, one getting drunk and waking up and realizing I have to make a living at this. 2011, going to that seminar and realizing that people, people um, pay for this and they consume it and it is its own industry. And then three months ago when I realized that I can that I can dissolve all of my interests and talents down to one thing, just long form direct response sales copywriting, and then charge significantly more money for it. So those are my three aha moments. If you could time travel back to day one of your entrepreneurial journey and have 10 minutes with your former self to communicate any lessons you've acquired with the intention of saving yourself mistakes and heartache, what would you tell yourself? Stop jumping around so much. Um, it's just... You know, I, I was constantly looking for a quick, easy money, I think. Yeah. I, I, I eventually always came back to writing, right? And I always came back to copywriting. But I was always looking for something else that I thought that would be easier. So I got into like affiliate marketing. And then I, I got into product creation at, at one point, you know, even though I didn't really have anything to offer. I got into to uh, <laughs> like just all sorts of random little things that I thought would make me quick, easy money. And I wasted a lot of time on, and then I would eventually go back to copywriting. Like I did Teespring sales for a while when I found out that people were making like 40, 50, $60,000 a month doing Teespring. And, you know, and, and, and so I kept jumping around and then I grudgingly go back to this copywriting thing that I thought I hated. I'd, I'd tuck my tail between my legs and you know, go, I got to sit here and write another stupid thing, <laughs> right. you know, because, because at the time I was charging not a lot of money for, so I obviously had to take on more jobs and they would pile up and I just was constantly writing and constantly working and I hated it. Um, so, but if I, if I could go back, um, I'd say stop jumping around, just do that one thing. Uh, you always, that's the only thing you're good at. That's what's making you money. Just do that one thing. If I had done that, then I would be able to charge the prices I'm charging now five years ago. I would have. Because there was giant yeah. three or four month chunks out of each of those years, like three or four months of my time wasted and gone trying to sideline myself into a completely different venture with a huge learning curve that I thought would be easier money. And if I had just stuck with, with what I was doing and then – took it more seriously instead of just thinking about it as this monkey on my back, then, then I would have been where I am now five years ago. Hmm. What's a personal habit that you believe contributes to your success? Uh, pen to paper writing, like literal pen to paper on a notepad. Um, when, I, when I research for my work, I uh, like if I'm at a website and I'm researching – I'll hand copy everything that I'm reading. And usually I don't even go back and look at the notes. I'll fill up entire notebooks and I won't even really go back and look at the handwritten notes. But I hand copy everything that I read and it, and it helps me retain the information exponentially. And then the other thing that I do 
as what's called rote exercises, and I started doing those about two years ago. As a copywriter, this is very, very important. Um, it's essentially going back and looking at the highest performing sales pages or VSLs that you can find and literally hand copying them. Huh. And, and so, you know, how, how does that uh, help you be better at copywriting then? Well, first of all, every great copywriter ever has done the same thing. They've always done this. Um, but, but what it does is, is, is like I train Muay Thai and I used to train Kung Fu as well. And uh, what, what did you do? You repeated the same thing over and over again until you didn't have to think about it anymore. Right. You know, you, did, you, drilled, that, you drilled that combo over and over and over and over again. And, then, and then, then when someone tried to punch you in the face, instinct took, <laughs> took over. So what you do with these rote exercises is by copying these really great sales pages, you start to find an underlying structure. And the structure seeps into you and it becomes automatic. The headlines, the, the way things are phrased, uh, you know, sales writing is, is, is a scientific art. Um, so by hand copying, that's the best way to learn, I would say. I mean, when, when, I, when I first started writing, what did I do? I, I, I looked at the books that I loved and I started typing them out. I typed out Fitzgerald, you know, books. Really? Um, huh. Yeah, word for word, just because I wanted to feel what it was like to write the words. Hmm. So that, 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 that idea of hand copying other people's work or typing it out even has always been with me from, from the start. Hunter, because I found out about it because Hunter Thompson would sit there and read like Rudyard Kipling and then completely copy the book. Just, and he, he, he wrote, he recopied uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls. Uh, he recopied it five times. Wow. Yeah, writers, writers do this, and I think one of the best habits you can do if you want to be a, a copywriter, a writer of any sort, is to hand copy your research and constantly copy other great writers, literally pen to paper style, literally word for word, punctuation mark for punctuation <laughs> mark. It's tedious and it's time consuming, but I, I still do it. About three days a week, I spend an hour hand copying sales pages. That's phenomenal, man. What's a quality that you would consider essential to being an entrepreneur that, that you also have? Not making excuses and not complaining. Not making excuses for failure and not complaining. Um, one of the reasons I don't like to call myself a digital nomad too much is because the overwhelming majority of, of the digital nomads that I, that I meet in places like this, they, 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 they don't make good money. I, I don't even know how they could call themselves a digital nomad if they, they're drawing in like $500 a month and the rest of it's mommy and daddy's credit card, you know. Um, and, and the thing about it is that, is that the, the one thing that I notice from unsuccessful people or people who will just never be a success is that they constantly make excuses for their own failures. I failed because, and it's never because of them, it's because of all the outside conditions they have no control over. I failed because the economy. I failed because my client. I failed because this happened or that happened or the other thing. They never talk, they never blame themselves. If you're gonna you know, you should be saying I failed because I could have done better. It's always your fault. One hundred percent of the time it's your fault. Even if some outside you can't control the outside forces. What you can do is control your reaction to them. And by not making excuses, you know, you you take responsibility and you just do better next time. The other thing is complaining. Just constantly complaining. Why can't I do this? Why is everyone else able to do this and I'm not? Why, why can't I, you know, just the complaining. The complaining never got anybody anywhere, you know. Right. So those are the, those are the two things I would say. No, that's phenomenal, man. I did a, a, a short stint in the Navy and, and uh, that was one of the main takeaways, one of the main things they always drilled into us was if you mess up, never make excuses. Um, you know, just, just shut up and, and do the work, do better next time or, or redo it. And so... Phenomenal uh, t- trait to be able to have. Just take "butt" out of your freaking yeah. vocabulary. <laughs> I, I I failed, but 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 just shut up. Just it's your fault, even if you don't think it is. Just accept it and then figure it out. And move on. Absolutely, man. Good word. What's a book that you would recommend to us, and why? Uh, the Forty Eight Laws of Power by Robert Greene, definitely. Um, you know, a lot a lot of people. 
like me, they, they try to reference like inspirational books, like, oh, this copywriter, or that marketer, or, or this guru. Um, I read books on social mechanics and war strategy and things like that. And uh, The 48 Laws of Power by far is a book that I continually go back to um, and read over. Um, it's, it's social strategy. It's universal truth. It's, it's, uh, it's the raw mechanics of how real life power structure works, how you need to manipulate and connive and, and uh, uh, play the, the game that is life and existing in this life. And, and one of the things I really can't stand about people – is their cushy, rose-colored, over-idealistic dream world that they seem to live in. I'm, I'm, I'm really a, a, a realist. I guess I used to be an idealist. I'm not anymore. This is the way life is. And I would say if you really, really want to get, I would hope pe- more people would want this, to get over your, your like, idea of how life should be. And if you really want to look at how it actually is, how it actually is in its raw form, the best place to start is by reading The 48 Laws of Power. Hmm. That's I haven't read that one yet, but no, I'll have a link to it in the show notes, and I'm going to have to pick that up in Audible for sure. It sounds like it sounds like it's talking about personal power, but that's not what it is. It's it's talking about the laws of what makes someone powerful, like what makes someone dominating and powerful, and it gives countless historical examples. It's it's one of the best thought out books I've ever seen. I mean, one of the, the law number one is that there's always a master, like that's that's the first law, and the, the, you know. Uh, that there's always going to be someone over you playing the puppet that you're going to have to be uh, subservient to, whether that's a boss or a government power structure. There is always going to be a master, you know, that you're going to have to act as a courtier to. So, I mean, the, the first law right off the bat uh, disrupts a lot of free thinking people that want to think that they have no master, that the only master is themselves. But it's not true. There's always going to be someone you're answering to, and the way that you answer to them sets you up for continued success. So, so yeah, the 48 Laws of Power is, is definitely something that will change your, your view and also give you the tools that you need to play the, the, the game. What's an internet resource that you would recommend to us and why? Banana tag. Banana uh, tag? Banana tag. This is like my favorite thing in the world right now. Uh, banana, banana tag is a... Uh, it can, I think they have it for Firefox as well, but... It, I use it as a, a Chrome extension. So what it does is it plugs into, in, into Gmail and it allows you to track your email. So let's say you send an email to a client or a potential client or something like that. It tells you when they opened it and if they clicked anything inside of it and what they clicked and when they opened it and what they opened it on. The reason I recommend this is because you know, even if you have like – um, an email marketing client, you're usually not sending out individual emails with, with an email marketing client like AWeber or Infusion. You're not sending out, you're sending into large amounts of people. But if you're just sending direct communication to people, I want to know if they open that stuff. So, so let's, say, let's say I've got a potential client, right, that someone referenced me to. And uh, I send them an email, you know, saying, hey, Jimbo over here said he got a project going on. It really works well for me to know when, when they opened it or if they opened it and if they clicked the link in it, for example. So if, they, if, the, if like three days past that happens, I know that they opened it. So I can email them again saying, hey, did you get my last email? So when people say something like, no, I didn't get your last email, I'm like, ha yes, you did. You opened it. <laughs> but it's, it's not just that. It's like if, I, if right. I'm talking to current clients you know, and I send them something over, there's something about being able to see when they opened it and if they opened it that has actually just g- gives me like a sense of like, okay, so I know that they're reading over that now. And, and another thing it helps with if you're doing individual, let's say you're doing inquiries, cold emailing, maybe, maybe even lukewarm emailing. Let's say right. you, you want to get in contact with, uh, with some guy who owns it. Let's say you, you for example, with, with Dropout Podcast, you, you want to contact this guy who runs a blog to get him on your podcast, right? The, one right. of the biggest problems is let's say you, you get his email and you, and you email him. You never know, did that guy open my email? Like, like, did he get it? Okay, did it go to a junk folder or something? Did he click the link inside, check out my website? Banana Tag allows you to, to know when they opened it and if they click the link inside without having to send it through your email marketing client. You can send it direct from Gmail. So I really, really like that a lot. 
All right, man. We got I got two more questions for you, and this one pertains to both of these pertain to basically the the two types of listeners we get on the show. And the first one is, what parting piece of advice do you have for our listeners who are thinking of dropping out, but they haven't quite made that decision yet? I was looking through your question list, right, and it seemed like the majority of the dropping out uh, people would be college, right? Not really high school, yeah. Correct. Well. We have a few of them, but mostly college. I would college, say yeah. that co- college. Listen, unless you're you're trying to get into engineering, you know, or the medical field, for example. Uh, all right, mm-hmm. if you're going to college for for business, or you're going to college for art, you're going to college for videography or photography. If you if you're in some kind of media, if you're going to college for marketing, God damn, I swear to God that like I'm sorry for cussing, but marketing. Market marketing uh, uh, graduates don't know crap. I don't know what they're teaching in these schools. Like they don't even know the basics of 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 conversions or what what that, what even a conversion means. Like they they wouldn't know. They don't they don't know basic things that they need to know because what they teach you in college for marketing, for example, is how to be creative, right? And they they don't they, they're they're teaching general creative copywriting, which is which is. For, for agency work, which is one of the worst things that you can do. Um, it's, it's the worst kind of job. It's the least low paying for the, for the most amount of work. And it's the hardest to get into, right? So it, it, I, when, when I was making the decision of whether or not I should go to college, right, I, I, the options that I weighed was, was can I learn it on my own? And if I can learn it on my own, because what I, what I figured college was, was essentially you go to a classroom and they tell you to read books and they give you lectures. Well, there's lectures online, and yep. there's books I can read. I could just buy the books. Right. So do, do I, can I learn it for free? And if you're, let's say you want to be a, a graphic designer, why would you ever go to college for that? There's so many free locations online where you can learn to, to do graphic design for free or, or for very low cost, like $20 per month, and you can start getting jobs within the first six months. Um, or what about programming? There's entire code, like coding academy and stuff like that. It's 100% free to learn programming. I, w- I learned HTML by the time I was 14 years old just because I bought a big fat HTML book. I mean, why would anybody go to college for that? Uh, software development. Uh, <laughs> why? Why would anybody go to college for that? Uh, 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 marketing, uh, painting, uh, writing. Writing. Why would anybody go to college for writing? I mean, I got published at 19. I'd never been to college. I learned to write by reading books and, and, and actually sitting down at a computer writing. And it's such a scam for those particular right. types of, of industries, right? So if, if, if you're in college, ask yourself, can I learn this for free? And let me tell you something else. No one, not a single freaking person in my entire seven-year-long career, regardless of who I worked with, ever ever asked me to see if I, have, if I had a degree. No one cared because all they cared about was, am I good at what I do? How does my portfolio look? And do I get results? And if, if you're like a painter, who the heck is going to look at your degree? And why would you ever go to college for that? I, I was in Savannah, Georgia that has one of the largest um, uh, art colleges in the country, Savannah College of Art and Design, one of the most prestigious. And I swear, I was writing scripts and stuff for, for short films when I was there. And I would read, I, I, got, I thought that for some reason I was under the illusion that people in college knew more than me. So I would ask to see their scripts. Like I'm talking about, I'm talking about third year, fourth year students who are about to graduate. And they were in like, like, like writing for film major, for example. Right. I would ask to look at their scripts and they were terrible. Their paintings were terrible. I was painting better than them. I, I'm a painter as well. I've sold my canvases for up to $5,000 a pop in Buckhead Galleries in Atlanta. And I never went to college. For that. I'm a better painter than most of those people that went to college. And I'm telling you, I'm a better marketer than most of the graduates. Even four years after they graduate, I'm better than them. I'm, I'm just, and, and the thing is, it's, it's not bragging. It's just I'm better, and I don't know what they're teaching in college. But if you can learn it for free, if you can find it online and learn it for free, and if, and if you're in an in a, uh, uh, industry that's results-oriented, okay, then you don't have to be there. You shouldn't be paying that money. It's a scam. Now, if you're going to operate on me in surgery, I definitely want you to go to college. Yeah. 
Absolutely, man. Dude, I love what you're saying. 100% completely agree. And, and uh, it, it's great to have great to have people on the show like you that are just so, um, yeah, you're just speaking the truth. Speaking the truth, man. Um, last question here. What advice do you have for any of our listeners who've already dropped out and who are already, you know, pursuing their dream job or entrepreneurship? Well, not being a high school, uh, uh, not being a college dropout, I feel like is is a little different because um, I dropped out earlier than most people, and I never had that college experience. Um, you know, when I dropped out, I was sixteen; I wasn't even twenty yet. And I think most people that drop out of college, they they'd be, you know, nineteen, twenty years old. Um, and the thing is, like, I feel like I'm about to give the most <laughs> mm-hmm. stupid, like quintessential cliche advice but there's nothing really you can say in in that environment other than just just do it like nike style you know just you've got to just keep going and everyone is going to rag on you the thing that they got me I, I think is is i never had the the college learning experience but i did hang out with a lot of people that were in college so i got like the party environment without the the learning environment but um with when I was in college, uh, when, I, when I was hanging out with those college age people and all through their whole four years, basically, I always felt really like I was missing out on something or that I, I was always second guessing myself or I felt like they were doing better than I was um, because, because it just seemed like they, they were always like talking about finals and then, and then they've got, you know, this thing that they're working on and their, their classroom assignments actually sounded intellectually interesting to me. And, and I had this whole idea that, that they were, they were doing better than me. You know, they, they got like, I, I remember when like all the SCAD kids, Savannah College of Art and Design kids would like go to Italy and France and stuff to, to do these like three or four month, these, the uh, study sessions or what, I don't know what they're called. And I remember that they would take breaks from school and they'd travel all over the world. And I, I felt like this kind of keeping up with the Joneses feel. I felt like, I, I, but, but, now, but now, let me tell you something. I just turned 30. All those people with the advanced degrees, almost every single person with those advanced degrees are sitting around asking me <laughs> how they can do what I'm doing. And almost all of them are making crap money. They're, they're usually not even going to, they're not even doing what they went to college for, which I don't even understand. Why would you go to, why would you go to college for something and then not do that thing? You know, so, so they're, they're not anywhere near what I am. So I think there's this, this, comp, this fear of missing out or competition anxiety with the people that are in college when you're right, out of college. Right. Like in, and there's like a second guessing thing. But let me tell you, the only other few minority of people that I know that are successful dropped out of high school or college they, they, I, 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 John, who I want to reference to, is a multi freaking millionaire, I think. Last time I talked to him, you know, he dropped out of high school the same time I did. He went to college for like two semesters. It's just don't let the competition anxiety, the, the, or, or what people are telling you, it'll look like, it'll look like because they're in college that they're being more successful than you. But while they're studying in an environment that is virtual, you're working in an environment that is real. The experience that you're yeah. building up is, is by necessity of having to succeed is leaps and bounds. You're four years ahead of them at that point. By the time they get out, they've got to play catch up in the real world. You've already went through everything. Learning by doing is more valuable than learning in this virtual, cushiony, you know, safe place environment these <laughs> colleges are, are advertising. Yeah. Absolutely, man. Great, great word. And and last question here: What's the best way that people can connect with you? All right. By the time this this podcast comes out, um, darkartscopywriting.com. Even if I don't have everything up yet, um, I'll definitely have a contact form where you can get on my email list and and stay in contact with me. So I think that right now that's the best place, and I'll have it up by the time this comes out. So it's darkartscopywriting.com. Awesome. And we'll have a link to that in the show notes. Well, successful dropouts, you've been hanging out with William and Kylan, learning what it takes to drop out, grind, and succeed. For everything we talked about today, head over to SuccessfulDropout.com and type William into the search bar and the show notes will pop right up. And as always, stay hungry, stay foolish. Stay foolish.